Welcome to Building Animated Cocoa User Interfaces. I'm Derek Horn. I'm the Application Technologies Evangelist. And uh, being an evangelist, over the last year, we've spoken to thousands of developers about all of our new Leopard technologies. And overall, we're getting a really enthusiastic response from all of our technologies in Leopard. And it's really great to see. But hands down, the technology that more developers are looking for than any other has got to be animation. This is the technology that is really driving more developers to writing the next version of their applications for Leopard only. So what we've done today is we've broken animation up into two different sessions. Today we'll present animation from kind of the view level, the user interface level. We'll take Q&A, and then we'll give you about 15 minutes to jockey for position, get better seating, and then following that we'll present uh, animation from the core animation engine layer, how to bring those APIs directly up into your application and give it that really immersive experience. We also have um, coding head starts for core animation. These coding head starts can be found in your WWC attendee area, and they include a video, a readme, some tutorials, and sample code. One of the sample codes, for instance, displays how to use cover flow in your applications. So <clears throat> before we start talking about animation, we should really define what animation is. And to do that, I turn to the Mac OS X dictionary. And it says, animation is the state of being full of life, vigor, liveliness. It comes from the Latin term animare, instill with life. And I think animation really provides the means to bring the user experience of your applications to life. It allows you to think about the way that you portray your data, the way that you're interacting with your users, and, and really change that. Um, I think as developers, we tend to use lists and tables a lot. And this is kind of a paradigm that works great for developers, but may not always be the right paradigm for our users. So at the same time, when you consider adding animation to your application, don't go too crazy. Keep things quick, meaningful, and something that really adds value to our users. So overall, I wanted to talk a little bit about the overall architecture. And when I think about the architecture, the heart of animation is really the core animation engine. The core animation engine really relies on layers. Now when I think of layers, I think of layers as these transparencies that sit on top of my screen. I render my content onto these layers. I can then move them around. I can shrink them, grow them. I can maybe change the Z order by putting other layers in front of them. I can even apply these complex matrix transformations to them to make these layers swirl around the screen. And we really get great performance out of this because we don't have to re-render that content. Once it's rendered onto that layer, we keep it cached. Now we further improve on that performance <clears throat> by letting it sit directly on top of OpenGL and taking advantage of the hardware acceleration that the GL pipeline provides. And then we further improve on that performance because now all the machines that we ship have at least two processors on them, so we allow core animation to run in its own thread. And then even to further improve on that, we rely on the multi-threaded OpenGL layer. So you can see that we're really trying to eke out the best performance we can from this whole pipeline. But at the same time, core animation is also this great graphics unification layer. And really what I mean by that is now we can start to render different types of content onto these layers. We can render QuickTime, OpenGL, Quartz Composer, text. We can render pictures or controls onto these layers, and we can kind of coalesce them all and flatten them so we can have an OpenGL background, controls in the foreground, or text scrolling above that. Now in the past, this was pretty difficult to implement. Uh, one way of doing that would have been to create these child windows, these, invis these invisible child windows, and stick them all right next to each other. But then that really meant that we had to add logic into our code to keep track of these extra windows. And now we're giving that all to you for free. And then what I really think is interesting is we brought all of this power that the core animation engine provides for you, and we brought it right up into the view layer. And that's what we're really here to talk about today, is adding animation to your existing user interfaces and to your views. And to, and to do that, I'd like to welcome James Dempsey on stage. Thank you, James. Thank you, Derek. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing this afternoon? That bad, huh? How's everybody doing this afternoon? That's uh, somewhat better. OK, um, my name is James Dempsey. I'm an engineer working on the Coco frameworks. And today, we're going to be talking about building animated Coco user inter interfaces. So let's get started. So 
we've noticed that over time, user interfaces are becoming much more fluid, much more cinematic. We saw that uh, going all the way back in the original version of Mac OS X with the uh, magnifying dock and the genie effect, and all the way up through Leopard, even in bigger scale with things like CoverFlow and Time Machine. Um, but we're here talking specifically about animating Coco user interfaces. And in Coco, NS Windows and NS Views are the central classes that we use for implementing user interfaces. So we want these wonderful, rich, cinematic animation experiences, and we're using Coco with Windows and Views. So what we've done in Leopard to make it easy for you is to add a simple, flexible API to AppKit for animation. Now, you may have heard of this thing called core animation, maybe once or twice already. Um, we have this wonderful new underlying graphics technology called core animation. And another thing that we've done in Coco and Leopard is to harness core animation and expose its capabilities and functionalities to NS views. So what are we going to talk about today? The first thing we're going to talk about is how ridiculously easy it is to animate windows and views. And I use that word very specifically because when you see the half line of code it takes, that's ridiculous. Um, the other thing we're going to learn about is how to create and use views that are backed by these core animation layers. And we'll get to that, and that we'll find is a whole line of code. Um, and so with this one and a half lines of code, you're able to take all of that underpinning of OpenGL and then core animation built on top of it and have that in your application. And then we'd have an extraordinarily short presentation. But these will get you all of the default animations that we have built in. Um, however, there's a lot more that you can do. And so we're going to spend the rest of the time, or a good chunk of the rest of the time, talking about creating and using custom animations. So keyframes, following a path, grouping animations, using core image filters and transitions. Finally, we're going to talk about mixing various content types in your application. And then we'll do some usage tips. So we're already, what, a few minutes into an animation a session without a demo. So I think we uh, need to rectify that immediately. And so I'm going to have Troy Stevens, a coworker of mine on the Coco Frameworks team, come up. And he's going to show a little app called Coco Shuffle. Now in iTunes, there's a lovely feature called Party Shuffle, which is kind of this never-ending playlist. And we thought that using the new Coco scripting bridge that lets us talk to iTunes, um, we would write a small application that more visually demonstrates what songs are coming up in your shuffle. So let's take a look, Troy. So um, this is showing us essentially what is currently playing is in the front, and then what's going on is in the back. And I think we need some sound, but that's OK. It's an animation talk after all. We can just imagine the sound. Um, yeah, we'll just put it away. I think everybody believes that the Foo Fighters know how to sing. Um, and we'll get back here. And of course, we can advance along. And as we do, the new item pops up on the top, and we get a new first song. And let's do it in slow-mo so you can look at the pop at the top, because we're going to show you how to do that, where it pops in, opacity, springs back following a path along. Um, of course, at this point, I was going to say, boy, that's loud, Todd, would you, or Troy, just, would you please pause it? And when we pause, we're able to use a background filter to blur. And again, this is all being done with standard NS views. Those are image views. This is just an NS view with a box and a text field in it. And we're adding animation to it. So let's unpause. And in fact, we've also added tool tips to each item, because from the album, you might not know exactly what the song is that's coming up, and contextual menus. Let's try one of those contextual menus. There we go. Um, and again, it's as easy as setting the tooltip and setting the menu on a standard NS image view. 
Now, we might like this pattern, but uh, we might want another path to follow, so we added a few presets. Um, but uh, then we figured, you know what? Sometimes the presets aren't what you want. You may just want to edit the path yourself. And so we added a little Bezier path editor in here. And of course, it's all live. It's all advancing right from iTunes. You see it moving in the background there. And that's a little bit of what we can do with animation in Cocoa. Thank you very much, Troy. I'd also like to thank uh, Kevin Perry, our intern, who did a lot of work on that demo over the last week and a half or so. All right, so we hear a lot about animation. What I want to do is kind of frame things in terms of what are the different use case scenarios, who are the major players as you're thinking about adding animation to your Cocoa app. So um, we're going to be talking primarily about things happening in AppKit. Um, specifically NS views and some animation API that we've added. And then underneath AppKit is this wonderful graphics framework, Core Animation. And out of all of Core Animation, the things we're going to be talking about and referencing today are layers, as well as animations which help us define custom animations. So let's focus first on NS view, which is not new to the party in Leopard. We've had it for quite a while. And NSView provides a lot of functionality. It has all of the Cocoa controls, our NSView subclasses, or NS control subclasses, accessibility support, printing, um, complex event handling, like dealing with the responder chain, drawing the focus rings, handling full keyboard navigation, um, dealing with drag and drop. We saw tool tips and contextual menus. Um, cursor recs, tracking recs, there's a lot of interface that's part of NSView, a lot of the interactive experience um, that you want to maintain, you want to take advantage of that. You don't want to write your own text field from scratch. Doesn't make a lot of sense. So what we are doing is taking all of these views and making them animatable. So the second thing we've added, or the first thing we've added in AppKit, is an animation API. And the first scenario might be just basic common animation. I have a window. I need to resize it, and I want that to animate. I want to move a view from point A to point B. And to do this, we don't necessarily even need to bring all of core animation into the picture. We can simply use the existing AppKit classes and the new animation API to have some basic animations occur. However, Scenario two would be using what we called layer-backed views. We'll talk a little more in a moment, but again, you're using the AppKit API, but behind the scenes, we're using the power of core animation for all of the drawing, rendering, and animating. As well, you can continue using those AppKit animation APIs just as you had in the first scenario, but now it's bringing all of core animation to bear in the background. This scenario three, once we've done these default animations, you may want to do custom animations similar to what we saw in that Coco Shuffle um, demonstration. And in this case, you would be using, in addition to the AppKit APIs, you'd also be using CA animation and its friends, its subclasses, in the core animation framework to help define those animations. And there's a fourth scenario, which is sometimes you may just want to take one NS view and then do all of your animating down in core animation. Um, of these four scenarios, the first three we'll be talking about in this session. The next session will be focused a great deal on the, on the fourth scenario. Okay, so as we talk about animations, and let's get to getting things done, um, we're going to first talk about some fundamentals, and then we'll get into custom animations. So the fundamentals. In general, animation is fairly straightforward. 
objects have properties, we change the value of the property, and we want that object to then change gradually over time rather than jumping to the new value. Now in Coco, we have accessor methods, been using for quite a long while, to set new property values. Um, so we don't want set frame just to suddenly start moving things around where developers have not been expecting that previously. So we needed a mechanism for setting a new property value as well as triggering an animation. And we use what we call the animator. And here's that half a line of code I was talking about. So views and windows have animators. Instead of talking directly to the view or directly to the window and telling it to set its frame, for instance, instead you talk to the animator and tell it to set the frame. That will trigger the animation as well as set that value in the view that it's a proxy for. Now these animators are very handy. You can take one and you can hand it into any API that would normally take the original object. And any message that isn't animated will just pass it through directly to the viewer window. So with that half line of code, you can actually get a great deal done. Um, for all animatable properties, there are already built-in default animations. They're linear animations going from one value to another. They all have a default duration of a quarter second, so they're nice and snappy. And by default, they're all grouped into one event loop cycle. So if in the course of an event, you happen to move or change a few different items, they won't start and stop at various different times. They'll all be synchronized to the event cycle. And this is all happening with that half a line of code. Now you might, though, want to change some items. And one that you may want to change specifically is the duration. And we've introduced a new class in uh, Leopard called the NS Animation Context. And essentially, we begin a context or begin a grouping and end a grouping. Anything within there will be uh, performed at the same time, and we can also use that context to set the duration. And in fact, this is a very handy way to get that slow motion effect when you hold the shift key down, so you can wow people with the slow-mo kind of feature. And we'll show you how to do that in just a couple minutes. So I want to just emphasize that the animator and the animation context, they're general additions to Coco for animating. Um, so regardless of how you're rendering the content, um, for the basic geometry of views and windows, as well as a Windows alpha value, you can use just animator and the animation context um, and get lovely results. However, we do want to take advantage of that core animation underneath us. So let's talk a little bit about that. Core animation layers are at the core of core animation. Um, they are analogous to views. The rectangular areas, they have a hierarchy or a tree of sub-layers. They are buffering their content per layer. We can do all sorts of nice visual effects like applying filters, like the blur filter you saw a little earlier, and transitions, shadows, and masking, combining content types. So we want to use these layer things. In AppKit, we call using a layer a layered, or to back a view, a layer backed view. So here I have a stylized segmented control and an image view, and the little blue is just representing that they're part of AppKit, they're AppKit views. And when I'm making a layer backed view, essentially what I'm doing is literally creating these layers in the core animation context underneath, or core animation framework underneath. And then the content, instead of being drawn where it typically is, for a view, it is now drawn into the layer and cached there. And so we call these layer-backed views, gives us those per-view content buffering. In addition, some of the more, uh, or some of the visual effects of, or all of the visual effects of core animation come into play. So in addition to the content buffering, we also can apply core, uh, core image effects 
Like here, we've applied a glass filter to the image. We've changed the alpha value of the uh, segmented control. Um, and we can apply them and just have them set, or we can animate them. So in this case, we're just slowly coming back. Core animation gives us asynchronous animation um, happening on another thread, as well as we pick up the ability to do transition animations when we're switching subviews, and we can combine different content types. So there's a lot that we can pick up from an NS view if it is layer backed. So how do we make this happen? We uh, call this line of code. View, set once layer, yes. Um, and it really didn't strike, I've been working with this API, and it really didn't strike me until I was sitting in the Mac OS X State of the Union yesterday, and Bertrand, and all, they're talking about, you know, going on at the OpenGL layer and all the work they've been doing down there and the work they've been doing in the, in the core animation layer and all the work that's been going on there. And the full magnitude didn't strike me that there's all this work going on, and for me to get that to happen with my view hierarchy, I basically have one line of code where I say, yeah, I, I want that. Um, and I was like, that's kind of amazing. And in fact, if we really don't want to write that one line of code, we also do have a checkbox in Interface Builder, <laughs> which puts us back down to a half line of code. Great. Um, so as sometimes happens, that one little flag has big effects. So what happens when we do that? Check that off. A lot's going on underneath, even though we've just made a little tweak. So AppKit is mirroring your, that entire view subtree into a tree of layers. However, from your standpoint as the creator of a view, draw rect is still being called when drawing needs to be done. You still use set needs display, and it passes the, it does the appropriate thing in the core animation framework to make sure that that layer that's backing your view does the right thing. Um, and view properties are basically, as you change them, they're sent down to the layer um, as layer properties. And then if there are non-layer properties that we've made animatable, um, AppKit will handle that animation. Um, this last bullet point, rather than trying to explain it, let's just talk about it looking at a picture. So we have a view hierarchy. And that wants layer very much expresses, not that you're necessarily that your preference is going to be respected or not respected in this sense. When I say set once layer on any particular view, that view and all of its subviews in the view hierarchy are backed by a layer. And this is true then if, say, higher up in the hierarchy, somebody wanted a layer, then from that point on down the tree, there it is, we would see backed by layer. However, if, say, that first view decided, no, I no longer want to be backed by a layer, it's already part of a hierarchy that does want a layer, so it retains its layer backing. Now, another nice addition to Interface Builder is that when you're looking at the Animations tab, for any selected item, it will show you the entire view hierarchy, and it will show you if anywhere in the view hierarchy in Interface Builder, somebody wants a layer. And I think that's a very handy feature. OK, I wanted to bring up one other point about layer backing, which is that it certainly is wonderful and extraordinarily powerful, but if I have a preference pane with checkboxes and stuff, and it doesn't usually animate very much, it can be quite overkill to make every single thing layer backed because we're caching all of that content, right, in video memory. And so it can be a very nice uh, strategy if you have typically boring views that occasionally do something exciting um, and animate to toggle layer backed mode. So turn it on and then they all get backed by a layer, have the animation occur, change the animation using the animator, and then turn layer back mode off so that those resources can get reclaimed. All right. There we go. I also wanted to point out that as a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? As a 
side effect, not even a side effect, there's a direct result of being layer backed. NS views pick up some new visual properties. Alpha value, shadow, as well as the ability to apply uh, content, or excuse me, core image filters to the content as well as the background in a compositing filter. In addition, you can set all of these up in Interface Builder. OK. I'm going to bring Troy back up. We're going to demo using default animations. Everybody likes the shuffle. OK. So the first thing we have here, it's a very simple application. And I believe if this is not available already as sample code, it should be very shortly after the session. Um, it's a simple Cocoa application. And we're just going to first move this NS image view the old fashioned way using set frame origin. And it jumps from spot to spot. We can even jump it back. And now let's animate it, because that is pretty jumpy. So we'll take a look at the code. And in the spot where we do that, move view, the image view set frame origin, we're going to, instead of talking to the view directly, add that half line of code and talk to the animator. Then we'll recompile. And now we've added animation. Now, if we switch to the medium size, I have different size views here. And then we'll try large. Go back to medium. Um, you'll notice that we're resizing the, uh, the window as we go. And we're also, I believe, getting a crossfade effect. Let's try it with the shift key down. Oh. Ah. We were not getting a crossfade effect because we were not wanting a layer. When you run into a situation where you're not seeing the animation that you're expecting, because it does happen, the first thing to check is, is it because I forgot to make myself layer backed? Now that we do want a layer, we're getting that lovely crossfade effect. And try it with the shift key so we get that slow-mo effect. And so we saw the line of code that we wanted a layer. Now let's take a look at the line of code that's both changing the size of the window and the line of code that is doing the switching of views. So back in Xcode, in switch view, most of the code is just figuring out what the new and the old view are based on what was clicked, figuring out the new frame. But then the core of the code is there. We begin and end in animation context grouping. We only need to do this because we want to implement this shift key slow-mo effect. We do that in two lines of code, where we check for the shift key. And if so, we bump the duration up to a second. And then the core of the work is we tell the content view to replace its sub view, the old view, with the new view. But instead of talking directly to the view, we talk to its animator. Similarly, when we resize the frame of the window, we don't talk to the window directly. We just talk to its animator. And so in that little method, we're able to get that very common effect that we see with the animated resize and the subview swapping. Thank you very much, Troy. So. The point of, or up point that I would like to make at this point is that, yes, it's a line of code and half a line of code. Um, really, when it comes to building user interfaces in general, but animated user interfaces in particular, a lot of the work and or a lot of the time is spent deciding what you want to do. And what we're trying to do with the API is make it such that it's not the API that is the thing that you have to spend the time on, it's really the working on the usability and making sure that it's an effect that looks nice and that people would want to see over and over again. Um, 
With this line and a half of code, you can get a tremendous amount done in your application. However, sometimes we would like to do custom animation. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the two things we're going to talk about next um, are first defining custom animations, and then how do we set these animations? We're going to look at a few examples that are kind of little chunks of um, the things we've seen already so far. So defining animations, we use an expressive set of classes from the core animation framework. Rather than reinventing a new set of animation description classes, we're using the wonderful set that core animation has added. And we'll go through each of these or in a moment or two. But then once we have created an animation, how do we set it? And it's a very, um, well, I'll tell you. First, you create the animation. The next thing we do is add it to a dictionary. The key in that dictionary is, or the key in that dictionary is the name of the property that you want this animation to be triggered for. So in this case, if frame origin was set, that animation would be triggered. And then finally, we add that dictionary to the views, anim or we set that dictionary as the views animations. Now let's take a look at it in code. Create the animation, in this case a basic animation. Create a dictionary, in this case with one animation, one key, frame origin, and then set that dictionary on the view or window. After we've done that, at any point in the future, somebody talks to that view or that view's animator and sets the frame origin, that key is going to match up with the key in the dictionary, find that animation that we have added, and it will execute that custom animation rather than the default. We'll see this pattern a lot. So, in dealing with setting up these custom animations, core animation classes, these are the um, concrete classes or subclasses of CA animation that we'll be dealing with, as well as a media timing function to be able to uh, mix up or uh, change up the timing on things. A basic animation goes from one value to another. Keyframe, we can use a path, similar to what we did in the shuffle. Um, or we can go from one value to another. A group allows us to group a bunch of animations together. And finally, a transition as we move between subviews to define visual effects. All right, let's take a look at a little animation. And then let's take a look at it in slow motion. This is animation along a path using a single keyframe animation. So how do we do this? We use the CA keyframe animation class. We create one. We create a CG path to describe the path that will be followed. We set the path in the animation, and then we release the path. Um, I would like to point out that in this case, you'll notice that we're just making an animation. We're not tying it at the moment to any particular uh, key or property name. And then once we create it, we're going to set it. Again, we make that dictionary. We hand in that custom animation. We do it for the key, in this case, frame origin, and then set it in the animation's dictionary on the view. And now at any point, going through the animator, when that frame origin is set, our custom animation will be triggered. Now let's look at a more complex one, that pop animation. And there are two things happening here. We'll play it in slow-mo. Um, there's the opacity going from 0 to 1, as well as the size going from 0 to larger than the end result, and then popping back. So to put this together, we end up using an animation group. And in this case, we're doing a an basic animation, which is the, the alpha value going from 0 to 1. And we're doing a keyframe animation that scales the frame up and then back a little. 
then we're grouping them all together so that they all happen at the same time. So that's what's going on with the opacity or the alpha value going from 0 to 1. And then more complex is the keyframe animation, where we're starting at a particular rect. We're popping up to a size, and that's taking about, that is taking 80% of the animation. And then the remaining 20% is shrinking back down. So creating the basic animation is very, very simple. We create the basic animation. Now in this case, the basic animation and the keyframe animation are inside of a bigger animation. So we need to spe specify what property this animation is actually affecting. So we use animation with key path, and this will be affecting the alpha value. And then we set the from value and the to value. The keyframe's a bit longer. Can we create it? We can also call set key path to do so after we create it. We create the values, an array of, in this case, rectangles that we're going to set as the frame. And by default, those keyframes will happen at equal times along the period or along the animation. But we want them to happen slightly different times. So we will provide a set of times or an array of times between 0 and 1 that map to the rectangles for the keyframes. So we've created those two animations. Now the animation group, we create the group. We set the animations. It's just an array that goes into the group. And then as we might imagine, we create the ever popular animations dictionary. We set the dictionary. And now, in this case, we're setting in the dictionary the key alpha. Whenever the alpha value of that view happens to be set, this animation will take place. The final custom piece we'll look at are transitions. And this happens when subviews change. That was a, a basic um, built-in core animation transition. Um, we can also use any of the transitions uh, that are provided in core image. This is the photocopying transition. We'll take a look at doing both of those. It's just loving photocopying, isn't it? There we go. So a built-in core animation transition. We make the transition, and we set its type and subtype. And those are, they're a number defined in core animation. And then from there, it's that same old story. Put it in the dictionary with the particular key, in this case, subviews. Set it in the enclosing view, right? Because it's the one whose subviews are changing that needs to have this animation set. And then any time you change the subviews of that particular view using the animator, it's going to use this particular transition. Now, if we want to use a core image transition, the only difference here is that we, use, we create a core image transition filter and set it however we'd like. And then when we create the core animation transition animation, we set the filter and then do all the same things. So um, at least for me, the, what I see when I'm doing custom animations is that it is very much deciding what it is that you want to happen. And then those expressive classes make it very simple to tweak what's going on and kind of play with what's going on, um, and also just not get in your way. It's a fairly straightforward methodology. Now, what if you want to create some of your own animatable properties? Um, before we talk about that, I just want to point out that NSView and NSWindow do have a lot of built-in animatable properties. Um, so it may very well be that the thing you're thinking you might need to customize already exists. Um, so keep that in mind. And then also to really talk about customize or making your own properties, we need a little bit more formal discussion of the uh, API that we've added in Leopard. 
that animator that we've been talking to and that animation's dictionary, the ability to set it and then retrieve it from a view or a window, are actually part of another protocol, the NS Animatable Property Container Protocol. Um, essentially, possible to be adopted by any object that has properties that could be animated. Now, we're familiar with the first three, the animator, we've been talking to him all time. Um, animations, getting and setting them, that dictionary to define custom animations. Let's talk about those last two. And so how are these animations triggered? You talk to the animator, and then it looks for an animation. So that animation for key method, you don't call it. The framework calls it to retrieve the right animation for a particular key. And the first thing it will do is look in a custom animation or that animations dictionary if one is set on the object. If it's not set on the object, it will call that class's default animation for key to try to find an animation. And in fact, that's how all of the default framework animations show up. And so when animation for key is called after you've talked to the animator, it will first call that animations method to get whatever dictionary may have been set. If none is set or if there's no value in there for that particular key, it'll go on to ask the class for the default animation for that particular key. So that said, implementing a custom property is largely a two-step process. First, define a custom property. It needs to be KVC compliant, um, KVC setter method. It's also important to note that the setter method should trigger needing display or should tell the view that it needs to redisplay itself. And then second, provide a default animation for that property by overriding default animation for key. Now, once this is done, you can specify custom animations and set them for that key in an animations dictionary. Um, you can treat it pretty much like any other animatable property. And AppKit for these properties will be able to automatically, um, with a basic animation, interpolate basic scalar types. So let's look at an example. Here's the KVC compliant setter method. Important thing to note is the self set needs display yes, so it can redraw itself as it's animated. And then overriding default animation for key. And so all that's happening here is that if the key coming in is our custom property, we'll return some default animation. And again, a basic animation for any scalar type is perfectly fine. Um, otherwise, we'll just let the superclass return whatever the default default animation for key is. Okay, let's talk about mixing content types. So in the past, if you have had, say, an NS OpenGL view, and you've tried to put Coco controls as subviews, that's been something that hasn't been directly possible. We've had to do some workarounds, such as having child windows as overlays, that sort of thing. Um, with a layered back view, we're able to now mix and match these content types in a way we've really never been able to do before. So there are two ways we can go about doing this. There's an easy approach, which is that you create the view, an NS view, set that it wants a layer, and then create a core animation layer of the appropriate content type. And then we just say set layer and hand in that type for that view. And then that view will be displaying that particular layer with that particular content. But we can also add subviews as we've always done. However, if we have an NS OpenGL view, it's even easier. We can just create an NS OpenGL view, turn on layer backing, and that's it. We can then just add subviews, Cocoa controls, Cocoa widgets to that OpenGL view as, a, as subviews, um, just like any other view. And to demonstrate this, I'd like to bring Troy out. OK. So we have here is a rotating Earth. 
It's an OpenGL, NS OpenGL view. It is currently not layer backed. We have a little checkbox up top. We can spin it. We can do all sorts of stuff. But once we make it layer backed, what we've done is we've animated in an NS box that is holding Coco controls. And these are sub views of the NS OpenGL view. They're not a parent or child window. They're not some other done overlay, just a simple item. And then as we adjust the items, like let's do the roll, maybe the camera distance a little, we're affecting that OpenGL view. I'll turn on the wireframe. You can't have OpenGL without a wireframe. OK, and no wireframe. And we can also, of course, since these are layer backed, apply a core image filter in this case. We'll do that glass effect. We seem to like the glass effect. But of course, if we get rid of the layers by uh, hitting that checkbox, go back to the way we were. Those layers get collected up in the background. They're gone. And then let's turn them back on, because there we go. Thank you, Troy. So the other thing that I actually did want to mention is that um, all of the demos, as well as those animation movies, um, and hopefully even Coco Shuffle, we'd like to get to you as sample code. Um, some of that will be available this week at the show. And then some of it might take a little while for us to get it out to you. But our intent is to get everything you've seen here out as sample source code. Now let's uh, just talk close up with a few usage tips, some behavioral nuances. Um, because when we check that little checkbox, we really are rendering the content of a view in a very different way than we have been in the past. Um, so there are a few little nuances, one of which is that set needs display. You want to make sure that you're very specific about setting needing display or invalidating portions of your, your view that actually need to be invalidated and not possibly assuming that because somebody somewhere else in the view hierarchy above you is invalidating that you're going to get automatically redrawn even if you haven't asked to be. Um, so be very specific about your set needs display. Another thing to note is that in layer back mode when things move from point A to point B, as far as AppKit is concerned, as soon as the animation starts, that item is already at its new location. It's a visual treatment that it's moving along. And so it's a good idea, one, to turn off or disable, I should say, controls as they're moving so that users don't try to hit them because they, AppKit thinks they're already here. Um, and finally, layer content is drawn, axis aligned, essentially into a buffer. And then that whole buffer is composited in. So as we rotate stuff, it looks very nice. Um, but it's also the case that some things that you draw might not look pixel for pixel exactly like the way you draw or how we draw right now. Some performance tips. The first is to avoid redrawing. Um, so things that are not going to change very often, isolate those so that we can cache them and keep them cached. Um, and designed by compositing, applying effects, rather than redrawing, sometimes a core image effect can change, uh, make something look like its state has changed rather than redrawing a whole thing. Um, and finally, optimize that, optimize that backing store. If you're drawing something this big, don't have a view that's that big and waste a lot of backing store. So learning more, there's a good deal of documentation about this. Um, draft documentation for taking a look at uh, the custom animations. There's the uh, core animation headers. Of course, the Leopard App Kit release notes. I love the App Kit release notes. Um, and then, of course, the sample code that we will be getting to you, and some of which should be already available. For more information, of course, there's the website and Derek Horn. So some take home points. We really do want these wonderful, lavish, 
animated applications that just have an amazing user experience. Um, but we don't want you to have to completely re-architect all of your user interfaces to do that. What we've done is we've added a small set of API and the ability to access the vast power of core animation using standard views and controls. Um, and so we want you to keep designing those great user interfaces. Let us help you do so. And um, yeah, we're going to love seeing what you come up with. And um, from time to time in the past, um, they've let me sing. <laughs> so in the past, we've done little songs, or we've done fun songs about things like Model View Controller, uh, Model and Man. Um, the now somewhat obsolete uh, Coco Memory Management song, Hold Me, Use Me, Release Me. <laughs> and uh, well, this year, we, uh, well, let's just put it this way. Um, I guess sometimes in a person's life, they get a, a feeling deep down that's just so strong that really the only way, the only way you can properly express it is with, a, uh, with an up-tempo country western love song. <laughs> and so uh, we'd like to do that for you. Am I ready? Yeah, right now. I love you, I love you, thinking back on all the things that we've been through. Sometimes I take for granted all those many things you do. So let me take this moment just to say that I love you. And it's you. They say opposites attract, and so I guess it makes some sense. Well, I'm not big on parties, but you love handling events. I can't draw Tippy the turtle, no, nor Pete the pirate, too. But once you lock your focus, there's no drawing you can't do. I love you. I love you and all the subclasses in your retinue. Look it up. Sometimes I take for granted all those many things you do. Let me count the reasons why I say that I love you. Well, you got buttons and sliders, split view dividers. You never sent a rumor in Apple Insider. Handling the drag drop, spinning with the phone top. Tool tips is flip, makes you do the flip flop. Handling the menus, recommend. Well, you know, back that up a little bit. I, I forgot to tell you all a little earlier that, uh, well, this is a beta version of the song. Now, let me tell you, it's feature complete, mind you, but I won't have the, I won't have the words memorized till October. Go back, go back. We'll slow this down a little bit. Well, you got buttons and sliders, split view dividers. You never sent a rumor in Apple Insider. In the drag drop, printing like you can't stop. Tool tips is flip makes you do the flip flop. Menus in a context, cursor and tracking wrecks. You draw the focus ring when the user selects device independence, responder chain ascendance, and accessibility to you. I love you. I love you. It's a simple love, not much hullabaloo. 
I once sent a greeting card by Maya Angelou. The words were mighty flowery, but the gist was I love you. Well, I don't like to say you're easy. I regard you with respect. But it's easy to start drawing. I just implement draw wrecked. And then when something changes, I just say said needs display. You record what needs update and then redraw it as you may. Well, on that keyboard over yonder, there might be a typing sound. If you are the first responder, you'll be messaged with key down. As for handling a mouse that's been running around your bounds, I can build a better mouse trap with mouse up, mouse drag, mouse down. I love you. I love you. That's why I have your API as a tattoo. You've added lots of features, especially since 10.2. I'm running out of places to display that I want you. Well, for that car animation has reputation of turning a head or two is so dang good stuck it under the hood of every layer back in its view I love you I love you let me tell you one thing more just on trade new I might flirt with other classes but in the end I'm true Cause you won't be drawing a damn thing if you ain't got an SU. I love you. Thank you, Gordy. Thanks. Well, stay up here. I'm going to introduce you. Gordy. Thanks. <laughs> nice job, man. Oh, thank you. Fantastic job, James. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you very much. I also did want to introduce the breakpoints, which. I, not yet. <laughs> uh, this is Gordy Friedman uh, on guitar. And Victor Alexander on keyboard. I always call him the best slide advanced man in the business. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for That was fantastic, James. Oh, take that down. We'll look for you on iTunes. Do you have time for a Q&A? Yep. Oh, I, excellent. I think we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Perfect. <laughs> we could do another song. No, we're, have we rehearsed another song? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, let's do Hold Me, Use Me, Release Me. What the, yeah. But we'll do it quick. There you go. Encore. Unless you want some Q&A. <laughs> what, what did he say? If you do, there is always the Coco Labs, Wednesday and Thursday. Is this is in G? This is in G. Actually, you play, I'll sing, because that's what happened on the first song anyway. <clears throat> Hold me, use me, then release me. Yeah, go around again. 
Yes, we rehearsed this thoroughly. One more time. Here we go. When you are locking it, you must dispose of it. Yes, and if you should copy, release so your code is not sloppy. Do I have to explain? If you explicitly retain, then release me. Yes, release me. Oh, release me. Oh, oh, oh. hold me. Use me. Oh, oh. If you don't want me anymore, please, please just let me know. I've been, I've been sitting out here just waiting, just waiting to hear from you. We had some good times and I want you to know my accession methods are wide open for business, baby. But you know, I understand if, if you don't need me anymore, if you don't need me anymore, then please, please just send me a message, a simple message, simple message to let me know. And release me, yes, release me, release me. Oh, go into one of those uh, middle parts. If you, uh, go, we'll go around again. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, I got it now. Here we go. Yes, if you garbage collect me, be bothered to personally reject me. Send your bookkeeping clerk to do your dirty work and release me. Yes, release me. Oh, release me. Oh, everybody hold me. Use me. Then release me. One more time. Hold 